Hello and welcome to the first lecture in this series on Egyptian hieroglyphs. We're going to be talking about English grammar, specifically about parts of speech. Now, before I get going, I just want to say for the record that these videos will not be any good. And by that, I mean the technical aspects of video production. The audio will not be good. The editing will not be good. I will make ums and ahs and there will be pauses and that kind of thing. That is because this is not an exercise in video production. This is an exercise in pedagogy, something I'm doing largely for my own sake. I hope it benefits others, but ultimately it is for my own sake. Now the first two lectures we're going to be doing are an overview of English grammar, because I have found that it is necessary to have a really strong and technical grasp of the grammar of the language you will be learning a foreign language through in order to understand that language. Uh, this is a, something I came to an understanding of based on my own experience in the course I learned Middle Egyptian and Hieroglyphics from. I had several foreign exchange students who were quite intelligent but who struggled greatly with the material, ultimately dropping the class, something that I feel was in large part due to the fact that English was not their native language and they probably didn't know some of the technical grammatical terms in English, probably knew it in in their native tongue, but not in English. So I felt the need to make something like this just to go over the basics of English grammar. No, this is not an introduction to the English language. You should be coming into these videos with enough knowledge of English to understand like a high school or college course in history or in a foreign language or something like that. If you don't have that level of English understanding, these videos will be of no benefit to you, unfortunately, it's because you will not have enough English to, to get what I'm saying. If you're confident in grammar terminology, skip this video, skip the next video also. They're just about English grammar, no hieroglyphic stuff gets discussed, no ancient Egyptian stuff just gets discussed, just ignore them. We're going to be going over in this particular video are the parts of speech. This is kind of a point of contention among grammarians because no one can decide how many parts of speech there are in English. The way I personally like to classify it is that there are 10 parts of speech. Uh, some people do not believe in the existence of interjections or of particles. Some people like to split the adverb into more categories than are listed here. This is the classification we are going with. This is largely the classification that will be used in Hoke's grammar of Middle Egyptian as well for Egyptian words. And since that's ultimately what we're going to be learning out of, I figure it'd be best to do something that resembles that. Although this is probably not his exact classification either. I've divided the parts of speech into two categories that I personally think are helpful, the unlimited and the limited parts of speech. By unlimited, I mean, one may create new ones at any time whenever the need arises. New nouns occur all the time whenever something new is invented, a new concept, a new location, a new piece of technology. A new noun goes along with it. And oftentimes the processes involved become new verbs, things like it, or new adjectives and adverbs. Even new interjections arise, not quite as frequently, but I mean, just think about the, the various internet expressions, lol, omg, etc., that have become bona fide interjections. The limited ones, on the other hand, change only slowly as the result of natural linguistic processes and are not generally invented on the spot, although we do need an asterisk there for pronouns because English pronouns are undergoing something of a shift right now uh, as a result of an increase in the ability of individuals to express their gender identity and that kind of thing. Uh, we'll talk about that more when we get to it, but for the most part, the limited parts of speech remain pretty constant over time, changing only slowly. A noun is one of the simplest parts of speech. It's just a person, a place, or a thing, or an abstract concept, you know, friendship, hope, etc. Those are all nouns. Nouns in many languages are declined, the technical term, according to their gender and their number. The great majority, although not all, languages have grammatical number. Uh, in English, that means singular and plural, if there's one of something or multiple of it. Uh, some also have grammatical gender. 
English does not have grammatical gender. It's a concept foreign to English speakers. If you took French or German or Spanish or something like that in high school, though, you'll, you will know what grammatical gender is. Um, Egyptian does have grammatical gender as well, male and female, uh, which we'll get to when we come to it in a few videos. This would be what the chart would look like for English. Uh, the masculine feminine distinction occurs in like two dozen English words. Roughly, I'd say, uh, pretty much all of them are French loan words. Fiance, blonde, etc. do technically take an additional E ending in the feminine form as opposed to the masculine. Not common at all. Uh, the plural doesn't change in regular nouns. The plural is just an S applied to the end. This, of course, has exceptions. Nearly every language has some irregular plurals. English has plenty. Uh, the plural of ox is oxen, for example, although most plural irregularities are really just to make it more pronounceable, you know, putting an E after another S sound so you can tell the difference between the plural and the non-plural. Uh, English also does have a genitive or possessive form of nouns, which is just an apostrophe S applied to the end. Uh, this is not something that you really need to know all that much for Egyptian, but just an important side note to tack on that technically English does have a genitive, but otherwise we don't do anything with case with nouns. Uh, no matter where a noun is in a sentence, it's going to be the same, just matters if it's singular or plural. Adjectives modify nouns like nouns. They have a gender or a number. Uh, English does not care about the gender or the number or the case of adjectives. Uh, again, case, something we'll get to when we reach a language that properly has it. English really does not have grammatical case outside of the pronouns. And adjectives in English precede the noun that they modify. Adjectives can be put on a declension chart. The English adjective declension chart is not very interesting because other than a couple of French loan words, we don't change adjectives to be masculine or feminine or singular or plural. They're just the dictionary form everywhere. Egyptian is not so simple. They do decline their adjectives to match their nouns. Uh, this is pretty common. German does it too. Plenty of languages like to put endings on their adjectives to make them match nouns and gender and number and case, but English does not, so we can move on. Adverbs are a tricky category of words. In general, Adverbs modify verbs, but they can also modify adjectives or other adverbs or basically any part of speech. They're very versatile. In English, many adverbs end in an ending like li or wise. These adverbs tend to be the ones that originated from other words. Uh, you know, quick is an adjective. Quickly is the adverb version of that adjective. It also includes some very common words of time and place, like here and then, and their other counterparts. In Egyptian and in English, adverbs are not declined in any way, uh, which is pretty common across languages. I can't think of a language that I know that has a, an adverb that is regularly declined in, in any meaningful way. Interjections don't get a lot of attention by grammarians because they're weird. They don't really conform to normal sentence structure. They're just a word or a short phrase that exists kind of outside of a sentence or immediately at the beginning or occasionally at the end. They don't really convey a lot of like dictionary meaning. There's no object or action associated with an interjection. It provides a sort of contextual meaning and emotional meaning to the sentence, but it does not stand alone as a word. Again, there are some recent additions brought to us by the internet. That's why we can classify it as unlimited, because as we can see, the, the group of interjections we have changes a lot more than our prepositions, for example. And finally, among the unlimited words, we have verbs. And verbs are, in general, the hardest part of any language to master. English is, is pretty much no exception in that grammatically. Um, the orthography of English is famously difficult as well. You know, the spelling is tough. But the verbs grammatically are also difficult. Verbs have two basic functions. 
They either convey an action being done or they link together two concepts, uh, two nouns or a noun and an adjective or what have you. And this divides the verbs up into two categories, your action verbs and your linking verbs. Linking verbs is a very small group. Uh, you have your forms of to be like is and am, was, that kind of thing. And you have verbs that imply senses or a certain small set of change verbs as well. So if like to grow as in to grow old, um, to look as in to look pretty, smell, taste, sound, etc. Other forms of verbs can serve as other parts of speech, adjectives, nouns, adverbs, etc., as we'll see in a moment. The most basic form of the verb is called the simple present. That refers to just an action happening in the general present, not necessarily specifically ongoing. Uh, it is the pretty much the dictionary form. It's the first form that should be learned by any student in any language. Almost every language has some equivalent of the simple present. We'll be taking as our paradigm verb the verb to love, a trick I learned from my eighth grade English teacher. It's a regular verb and a very nice concept. This is a verb conjugation table. We'll be seeing a few of these when we start going over Egyptian verbs. In this case, you can see the first, second, and third person and singular and plural forms of the verb. Since English does not alter verbs by grammatical gender, we haven't listed that there. To clarify what I mean by first, second, and third person, the person of a verb or a pronoun refers to the relationship between either the subject of the verb or what the pronoun is replacing and the speaker. If the speaker is talking about themselves, then they would use the first person pronouns and first person forms the verb. The second person is the audience, either all of it or some subset thereof. And the third person is somebody not involved in the conversation. Uh, this is why it's rude to mention someone by the third person in conversation with them because it sounds like they're not being involved. In the simple present in English, we have the dictionary form of the verb, just love, for everything except for the third singular where it takes an S ending. And this is really the, the only case for a regular verb where that will differ by the person and number. The other major verbal forms that behave as verbs proper are the present perfect form, which is the ing form. Ordinarily, the, uh, if the verb ends in a vowel that is not pronounced, like love, the final vowel is dropped and an ing is attached. Otherwise, the ing is just attached to the basic form of the verb. The simple past and past perfect are rarely differentiated in verbs. The simple past would be I loved, the past perfect would be I had loved, referring to an event that was in the past, even at some earlier time in the past. In a small subset of verbs, usually monosyllabic, almost all of them quite old, this difference is illustrated by some change, usually a vowel shift. So for the verb to ring, the simple past is rang and the past perfect is had rung. There are also some nonverbal verb forms. Uh, the infinitive form, the to love, the dictionary form, is basically nominal in function. And the participle uh, is the basically adjectival form of the verb. You can see examples here. Note that I say basically because there are exceptions to those. Uh, the gerund, also in ing form, is basically nominal. It refers to uh, the action itself as being a noun. And then we also have helping verbs, which are something that are very common in English and somewhat common in other Germanic languages as well. A lot of tenses are accomplished with helping verbs. For example, English does not have a proper future tense. Uh, the verb does not undergo some kind of shift to indicate that it's happening in the future. You just put the verb will in front of it, and that accomplishes the same thing. I will love means in the future rather than the present or the past. Have tends to be a helping verb with past tense verbs as well. The forms of to be, especially being and been, do a lot of work as 
as helping verbs as do the modals, can, could, shall, should, may, might, will, would. The helping verbs take the infinitive form without the two, just that dictionary form, or occasionally a participle form, depending on what tense you're trying to express, and add themselves in front of it to add some additional meaning and tense information to the verb. One last piece of verb information to note, the active verb, which is the most common form of the verb, is when the subject does the action. I loved her. The passive form of the verb, one oftentimes not used in English, but one that is perfectly grammatically legal, if not stylistically loved, is when the action is being done to the grammatical subject. I was loved by her. Uh, in other words, the logical recipient of the action becomes the grammatical subject as opposed to the grammatical object being the recipient and the grammatical subject being the doer. Articles are just a special case of adjectives. In some languages, like German, they get quite complicated. There are a number of different forms of the article in that language. English does not have that. We have two indefinite articles, a and an, and the definite article, the. And the only difference between a and an is that and is used when there's a vowel, and A is used when there is not a vowel in order to make it sound a little better. The indefinite article indicates when someone does not really care what member of a group is being talked about, just important that it is, is that. So for example, if I were to say a bear, I would just mean some bear, I don't care which one in particular, as opposed to the bear, which being definite would imply that there was some particular animal, you know, one might talk about hoping to see a bear at the zoo, but one might be concerned about the bear that was in particular rummaging through one's garbage can. This is not particularly useful for Egyptian, actually, as Egyptian lacks articles, but it would be an omission if articles were not talked about. Prepositions are not a part of speech that can generally stand on their own. Prepositions must take a noun and zero or more adjectives and form a prepositional phrase. Note that adjectives here includes articles like the. So to the store is the prepositional phrase composed of a preposition, the noun it governs, and some adjectives or articles preceding that noun. Note also that the noun can be a group of nouns. We'll get more into phrases in the next video. And a prepositional phrase altogether acts either as an adverb or as an adjective. The adverbial form is a little bit more common, but you will see them both. For example, if one says that they were going to the store, that phrase to the store is an adverb modifying going. Particle is kind of a catch-all category. Uh, the technical definition is a word that is not declined, which is kind of awkward because that would include like all adjectives in English, which is not particularly good. So the way I treat it, uh, discussing particles, which is kind of a definition inferred out of how Hoke uses the term, is that it is an undeclinable word that conveys no particular meaning, but has important grammatical function. Some examples from English that I think are best classified as particles, even though some people do not, are the word not when it is being used, not as a conjunction, uh, but some, like to negate a verb or something like that, and interrogative pronouns, who, what, where, when, why, those all should be parsed as particles in my personal estimation, although there are those who would disagree with that. The personal pronouns are a category of parts of, of words that are used to replace nouns. Like verbs, they have person and member. And unlike any other part of speech in English, with rare exception, they maintain proper distinction between cases. A case is a way of telling where a word appears in a sentence. The two cases on the screen right now are the nominative, that is to say those in the subject of a sentence, and the accusative, which are those that are found in objects of sentences. This is a distinction that is sometimes hard to remember, but which native English speakers are quite familiar with. 
So looking at the pronoun chart, we have the first person singular and plural as I and we. The second person is in all cases you. The third, he, she, it, and they. Now that asterisk next to the singular for he, she, it is because of the usage of the pronoun they as a singular that has cropped up a lot in the past few years, uh, which is particularly interesting because when one wants to refer to a non-binary person who uses they, them pronouns, for example, one would say they, meaning a, you know, a single person, but then treat it grammatically as a plural. So if I were to talk about one of my friends, I would say that you know, they are non-binary, which is odd because they are is you know, grammatically plural, even though it is semantically or meaningly singular. Um, this is just kind of a, a quirk of how, how English has been developing in the past few years. And then also not listed here, also covered under that asterisk. Uh, there are a number of other like neo pronouns that have shown up in the past few years. I'm not going to go on listing them because there are a lot. Um, but those also do generally fall under third person singular pronouns unless somebody specifies otherwise. And those usually do take singular grammatical meaning. So so if you one were to use a neo pronoun, they would use is at the end as the verb or equivalent for whatever the the verb one is using may be. So that's it for the subject pronouns. For the object pronouns, it is me and us. Again, just you in the second person, and then him, her, it, including neo pronouns, etc., as mentioned earlier, and them for the singular and plural. And these are for objects of prepositions as well as the objects of verbs. The possessive pronouns work as adjectives. Uh, they take the place of a genitive, you know, that, that possessive. My, our, your, your, his, her, its, and their as the possessives. And then again, you know, there are standalone forms, uh, which are the mine, ours, yours, yours, his, hers, its, and theirs. Uh, so if one were to say that is mine rather than that is my, uh, if one did want, not want to specify a particular noun that was being owned. And then we finally have the reflexive pronouns. The reflexive pronouns are used either to emphasize when a, or what emphasize who did an action or who owns something or something like that, you know, I myself, or as a way of showing of referring to someone multiple times when they are simultaneously the subject and object of a verb. You know, I saw myself in the mirror. Uh, the, they are generally formed from the possessive plus the word self or selves in the plural case. Notable exceptions, himself rather than his self in most but not all dialects of English. Uh, and the sort of interesting conundrum of using either themselves or themself for non-binary people, something that really hasn't quite resolved itself yet, what, which one is more grammatically proper. Other pronouns include the demonstrative pronouns, this, that, these, and those, um, which, of which Egyptian has a full set, and the interrogative pronouns, which as I said, probably better parsed as particles. And then finally, we have the conjunctions, which fall into two broad categories. The coordinating conjunctions combine words into phrases and combine clauses into sentences with no differentiation between which one is more important in any way. Whereas the subordinating conjunctions create dependent clauses where the, the clause governed by the subordinating conjunction is lesser than an independent clause. And you may be wondering, what is a clause? And the answer is in the next episode, because it seemed best to split the two concepts up, because the clauses are important and will take a bit of talking.